All righty, here we go. Now we can hear each other. I think I played around with the screen a little bit. Hopefully. All right. Uh, welcome to the video. Sorry about the technical difficulties that we had just a little while ago. This is Model Man Frank here. Um, uh, we had a little bit of a problem there. Um, if you guys are joining this on playback, just push the thumb like up button. Try and join us every uh, Monday night at 7.30 p.m. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we will go live then, uh, 7.30 p.m. And I'll make sure that next time I have the, uh, the mic check going on here also. Uh, tonight's podcast is about uh, business jets and business aviation. Now you can hear me, QRC? Okay. I guess I had the uh, mic down, the uh, volume down, and it was uh, just some problems going on with the mic itself. You know, technical difficulties. Hopefully, hopefully, Colin joins us up soon, too. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about business jets. Um, hey, y'all. Hi, Colin. How are you? Good for you to join us. Thank you for coming in. Um, this past weekend, actually, let me just give you guys a little heads up. So this past weekend, I was... Uh, we had a night flight. If you watch some of the videos, you guys would see we flew the pig, uh, the uh, the uh, the EC fifteen hundred cargo plane that uh, Horizon Hobbies is. I call it the fat. I call it the flying pig, and we flew the uh, shuttle on top of it, and uh, we had three successful flights. So it was really a good flight, um, and. Uh, I don't know. Cargo planes just shouldn't be built. It, it's, you know, it's fun to do stuff like that where, you know, you, you, you attach a car, you know, a shuttle or something like that. But I got to thinking, I said, you know, I'm going to have to build something else. Maybe, maybe I'll build a B-29 or, or something else so we can get a Bell X-1 RC plane with a little rocket engine and everything like that. So got to thinking about it. And now I'm more, I'm looking for uh, other planes to build, maybe another big airplane to build, so we can uh, have uh, have some fun like that with that there. Um, but I also saw some of the guys brought, you know, bigger aircraft. Uh, Tony, uh, there's a guy there that uh, he he flies. Uh, uh, he has a, a corporate jet, which is it looks like the it's the free wing corporate jet. I call it the G5 RC or G5 because that's what it looks like, and. Um, you know, there's been a lot of like uh, bad badgering of guys, people flying around in corporate jets. And I'm sorry, but you know what? Uh, everything that happens in the aviation market employs somebody. And when you badger our seat, you know, people flying on, on private jets, you know, we don't want guys going to Davos and flying a private jet. Yeah, we want them to fly on a, on on uh, on commercial carrier because they're they're public figures. But private jets get people around. It's not only the elitists that fly around on private jets. You've got families that own jets. You've got uh, people that you know do business using their private jets. You've got corporations that own those jets, and they use them to fly to different uh, businesses or meetings and things like that. So it's just not you know politicians that go to Davos every year or every six months to meet, you know, and talk about, you know, how to ruin our lives mo much more. It's, uh, you know, it's it, those jets employ people. So a little history about private aircraft in terms of corporate aircraft. Um, one of the, one of the very first corporate style aircraft or business style airplane or private corporate style aircraft to be built was the Lockheed Electra uh, Junior. The Electra Junior was actually the plane that kind of started it all. Um, Amelia Earhart had one and she did her famous round the world flight that she tried to finish and she didn't come. She didn't complete it. She ended up disappearing somewhere over uh, Wake, I um, uh, Wake after Wake Island uh, in the Solomon somewhere 
there's still a lot of speculation of what happened to her and her uh, and her uh, her navigator. Um, but that's a, another podcast or another thing. So that was the very that was one of the very first ones. The Mo the Lockheed Electra, the Model Two, uh, uh, the Model Twelve Electra, came out in 1936, and only 130 of them were built. They had controllable pitch props, which that was pretty revolutionary for that time period. And, um, you know, they were later changed to constant speed propellers. Now, if you're not too familiar of what a constant speed prop is, a constant speed prop is when the prop is, is pitched. Uh, this is a constant speed prop. Um, it's also, it's, 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 it's controlled by the added power to the engines. Um, variable pitch props are rotatable, and they'll always be able to control uh, fixed pitch. I'm sorry, fixed pitch props. That's a fixed pitch. The variable pitch props are, you know, that's it's basically a good constant speed prop. Sorry about that. That was my mistake in, the, in, in explaining that information. So, oh, yeah, they're just like warbirds. Um, the, sec, the next of the planes that came out after around the same time and was pushing that whole, you know, uh, elitism and the wealthy could have a plane to get them to and from was the Model 17 which was also was a Beechcraft. Um, it came out in 1932, was the first flight, and was introduced to the public to purchase in 1933. Um, most of the ones that were built during the war were used by the U.S. Army Air Forces and the United States Air Force, but a lot of them fell into private hands. Um 785 of them were built. Um, the reason it was called the stagger wing, very interesting. So if you look at the stat, the beach craft, the, the stagger wing model had a wing that was one wing was more forward. Uh, let me see. So one wing was like, ah. <laughs> one wing was actually, here we go. One wing was actually, I'm sorry. One wing was more forward than the wing on top. So that's that was the hence stagger wing. Um, it it added to the flexibility and the speed in which the aircraft could fly. Gave it a lot of maneuverability. It was a biplane. It had a very large engine in it. Um, I'll tell you what size engine it had right now. Hold on one moment. Pull up my information here. Um, so the motors that it had. It's also computed uh, also with the travel air. Um, so when the plane came out, price on the stagger wing was between $14,000 and $17,000. Depending on the size of the engine and things like that you wanted and what type of, what type of uh, 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 you know, uh, bells and whistles you were going to put in the plane. You know, if you were going to have leather or, you know... Uh, different uh different options the very first ones that came out had fixed landing gear they came out with fixed landing gear and what was around the wheel was a a housing to pick up the speed like you would see on Cessna 172s and 152s nowadays or even on on uh on uh uh Cherokees Piper Cherokees so that was the that was when the plane first came out. Um, even the Air Force started to pick up on my I, I, I do do believe I have a photo of one. Markings of US Navy markings. And I do believe that there is a photo in here of a Beechcraft model 18. Let me see. I'm going to look in here really quickly. Hmm. I don't see it. 
Okay, well, I guess I don't have a photo of it, but there, there, there's another one of these books that actually has a photo of this, um, these aircraft, and it's somewhere in my collection up there. I'll have to look it up later. But the uh, – so when the Air Force, when the Army Air Corps uh, acquired and so did the Navy – uh, they, they developed their yellow, they had their yellow wings and then it was either a blue body or a gray body. That was their standard color. And then later on they came in with the two tone, uh, blue, I'm sorry, it was a three tone, dark blue, uh, Mediterranean blue, and then a white bottom with the stars and with the stars and stri uh, uh, white star and blue insignia on top of it. They didn't do the, uh, stars and stripes bars until later on in the war when they kind of started to really settle on it. Um, the motors were Continental uh, Wasp engines, um, Cyclone engines. And as the war progressed, they put in retractable landing gear on the stagger wing. It was a gorgeous airplane. If you, you know what? I even got a little video, one of those 15 second videos shorts actually shows the plane taking off. I mean, they are, if you're ever up close to them, if you ever go to like uh, one of the air shows and you see one there, take as many photos as you want. Uh, ask the pilot, hey, is it okay? I take some pictures. I think it's a beautiful airplane. Everybody would agree. It's just a really gorgeous plane. After that war, though, a lot of guys, they picked up warbirds to make them into corporate planes. Uh, one of the really good ones was the B-26. They turned it into a corporate plane. They basically, what they would do is they would strip out the bomb bay and they would put windows in it. And the problem was, is that through the middle of the cabin, you had the wing spar going through. <laughs> the wing spar would be going through. It was a bomber. It wasn't meant to be a corporate plane. Um, but uh, some even picked up. Some people picked up uh, old Catalinas and they turned them into corporate planes. Problem is, the Catalina is a pretty slow flying plane. I think top speed on a Catalina was 200 miles an hour. You really didn't want it. So, jet travel was making a big inception with the Dash 80 and the 707. So, the next aircraft that came out with that. Uh, 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 sense of speed and it was you know a lot of guy a lot of celebrities and the elitists and and wealthy people they got their they were able to get their hands on it finally was uh Lockheed Corporation put out what was called a jet star um it had the same wing uh kind of like the wing structure of uh swept back had a fuselage um, the very first flight of the Lockheed Corporation uh, Jetstar was 1957. Uh, it was introduced into the stream in 1961. Um, the Air Force picked up a couple of them to use them as liaison aircraft. There were 202 of them built. There were two engine en ones, and then there were four engine models. The four engine one, famous person right off the bat, and if you go over to Jimmy's World, I'll put the link in the description box below. It talks about trying to re-engine one of these. They had turbofans, not turbofans engines. They had uh, turbojets, and they were the loudest engines imaginable on takeoff. If uh, you ever want to hear what a turbojet sounds like, listen to, like, I don't know, um, Fugumastir, which is a little V-tail twin-seater uh, twin trainer. They're still around. Some guys still have them, but they are loud. They have a whistling noise to it. You have to wear earplugs when you're really close to it. I mean, they're really a really loud airplane. Um, the best, the, the business jet that are available are beautiful jets. Yeah, they are beautiful jets. We're going to get to some of the ones that are pretty, very pretty. Um, so Elvis was a purchaser of a jet star he had one that was painted all red and it had velvet seats inside the you know beautiful velvet with wood and later on it had a microwave in there and all sorts of stuff um 
but I think Elvis only used it like two or three times, and that's really about it. Um, but uh, later on, if you watch, like I was saying, if you watch Jimmy's World, he ends up buying the Elvis jet, and he goes through a whole list of trying to get the thing flying again and what it would cost. It would cost more than what he paid for the plane to fly to get the plane back up and running. So he decides to turn it into a rolling RV, which is kind of interesting. I all the power to him must be a great idea. But again, the plane needed a lot of work. Sitting out in the desert, it's got a lot of bird poop all over it. You know, it's just it's just one of those planes you just can't really you know throw it back together and accept that it's going to fly. Uh, yeah, rest in peace, Elvis. Exactly. Um, but, uh, that was, that was another one of, you know, the jet star had a fuel, had two fuel, had fuel tanks in the wings, and then it had fuel, uh, 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 pods under the wings for speed. The plane would suck through fuel like crazy. It was a gas guzzler because of those early style jet engines. The next one that came out that was supposed to be a speed breaker was the Learjet. Everybody had to have a Learjet because the Learjet traveled really fast. There's an Achilles heels about the Learjet. You lose an engine on the Learjet, you better find a runway to land very quickly. Those planes don't glide well. They fall out of the sky like you're landing the space shuttle. Uh, they have a high uh, incidence of attack when you have to come in for a landing. And they were also known as Widowmakers. Uh, this is what I've read. Um, I don't know anybody that's ever had to crash one, but I, you know, they just had a lot of accidents with those planes. Um, the very first ones came out in 1962. Um, I'll tell you right now when the, I'm sorry, the very first one. Uh, was the Learjet 23, the model 23. So the very first one, yeah, the, the company was founded by Bill Lear in 1962. It was a business jet. Um, it, nine, the first flight was in 1963. They were introduced in 1964, and the very first models were the 23. They only had like one window or two windows, and there were only like 100 of them built. But as time went on, Bombardier bought them. Uh, many more aircraft were built after that. Uh, the Model 23 and then the Model 35 and then the 45 and then the 60 was the last one to roll off the assembly line. Uh, they were built in Wichita, Kansas, and many celebrities had to fly them. A lot of people started to pull away when, you know, accident safety record was not that great. So, you know, again, you lost an engine. You had to look for some place to land. Also, the wingtips, as a person that used to fuel aircraft, to fuel this airplane, it was hard. You had to, as a person fueling the plane, if you had a single point, which is a single uh, connection point behind, the single point to hook up for the fuel, to hook the fuel in, was behind the engine, was below the engine and behind it, uh, kind of like you had to go underneath the engine and then plug it in and then start fueling it. That was for the single point. Um, but if you were, and no smoking, exactly, no smoking within 100 feet of the plates. Um, but the airplane had wingtips, wingtip tanks. So when you were fueling the plane, if you were by yourself, and this happened to me a lot, I learned how to do this uh, in school. You had to, so the plane sitting in front of you, you had a wing tank here and a wing tank here, right? You had to run, you would have to put 50 gallons on one tank, and you would see the plane move like this, and then run over and put 50 gallons in this tank, and then balance the plane back out, okay? Okay. And then run back over to this tank and put another. So if you had like maybe, I don't know, like 400 gallons, you had to go. You had to go back and forth putting 50 gallons in each tank. Because if not, if you put all the fuel, like 200 gallons in one tank, the plane would do this. And I mean, the tank would actually sink down to the floor. So there were a lot of accidents with people fueling the plane improperly 
and having that issue. Single point solved the issue on the Lear 45 came with a wing tank uh, with a single point action where the fueler could actually hook up the spout, lock it in place, and then fuel the plane. And then computers would do the rest by separating the fuel. The plane became really popular also with the, mil with, uh, the military shuttling liaison personnel back and forth between because it was very fast. It was a fast plane. Um, I think the top speed was close to 500, 400 miles an hour, three or four or 500 miles an hour. But the thing was, it was a thirsty engines. Uh, when Bombardier took it over, uh, the Lear 60 was the last one on the line that came out. It was a bigger plane. It didn't have the wing tank, wing tip tanks anymore. Uh, they went for winglets at each sides of the wings. But the plane was already... Uh, you, you couldn't stand up in the plane. Uh, not like our next planes that are coming out. Uh, Citation came out with a, a, a business jet. Around the same time, it was also known as the Craptation. Um, they broke down a lot. They had a lot of problems with the plane. Air conditioner would break down. I mean, just uh, so many different things. They'd have engine issues. Um, you couldn't stand up in those jets. Um, not like the Jetstar. The Jetstar, you were able to stand in, stand up inside. It was a, it was a pretty big, roomy jet. So as time went on, Citation started to bring out jets that you could stand up in. Also, you had the Hawker uh, 800, 900 series models that were coming out. Um, and then towards the 90s, I'm sorry, towards the 80s, the Gulfstream showed up on the market. The Gulfstream was faster, more reliable engines, and it was made for the uber-rich. And this is where the Gulfstream really kind of cornered the court made the cornerstone on uh, Gulfstream was actually produced by Grumman Corporation. They came out with the aircraft. I'll tell you exactly when was the first flight of the Gulfstream. Let me pull it up here on the, my computer. I'm sorry. I didn't have it pulled up before because we were having problems, technical problems, you know, Gulfstream G5. Okay, 550, because I think the 550 was the first one that came out. Uh, I'm sorry, the 550 came out in 2000. Two, but the Gulfstream four was the first ones. Here we go. No, I'm sorry. Gulfstream four. I, I've got so many airplanes built up in here. In my little. So in 1985, the Gulfstream four came out. It had a T tail, just like the Learjet. And so the Jetstar had a mid tail. It was not exactly a T tail. The, t the tail was actually just in the middle of that uh, uh, large tail, the, the, the elevators. The elevators were sm smack dab in that middle plane field just above the engines. The Learjet had a T tail, and so did the Gulfstream. But the Gulfstream had that the Learjets weren't providing was way for you to stand up. You could stand up. It was like flying on a corp. It was like flying on your own MD-80. Oh, they're, they're, the Learjets and the, you know, some of the planes that we're looking at are pretty cool looking. They're, you know, you just look at them and you're like, wow, that really flew. There were people that actually used that. As a matter of fact, the Jetstar was also used by uh, some famous, some presidents. It was loud, but it was a loud plane to fly on. I mean, you had to yell above your, you know, to have a conversation because those old early engines were loud. Gulfstream came on the market. Everything changed. It was a plane built for the uber rich, the celebrities and businesses, big businesses. 1985 was the first flight of the Gulfstream 4. And... um. They're still active. Those planes are still flying today. A lot of them went from analog gauge to all glass cockpit. They've changed out. 
Um, Gulfstream 3 came out in 1979. That was the very first ones, really. They came out. There were only 202 of them built. But when the Gulfstream 4 came out, that was the plane to have. So any of the Gulfstreams, being that the Gulfstream 2, 3 was the first real one to come out, there were only 200 of them built, but you could stand up. You could actually have people on board. You could pretty much have a party and or you could put a bed in it. Um, as a person that used to refuel aircraft, like I said, I worked the line and I used to work on some of these planes. Um, refueling it was like fueling an MD-80 or a DC-9. You filled it up. The, wing, the, the refueling portion port was actually under the wing. So you come where the fuselage meets and then the wing structure joined together. You pull this, open this little door, door would flap down, and then you have to get up underneath the plane and hook it up into place, and then you could fuel up the plane. Um, you could put about 1,000 gallons in the, in the tanks on a, on a Gulfstream, and the Gulfstream, you could go all over the world with it. You could fly from, let's say, Miami to London. You could fly from JFK to London. <laughs> you could fly to Germany with the plane. It was a world-traveling aircraft. The Learjet, on the other hand, wasn't really a, a world-traveling aircraft. It was limited by the space and range you could fly on. So was the Citation, you know. As time went on, Learjets and uh, Learjets started getting a little bit more momentum. But a lot of people started to move away from Learjets. I'm going to tell you one of the worst looking airplanes to ever fly or ever to buy for any elitists is the uh, Beechcraft Premier. I saw one of these and it's like Beechcraft decided, you know what, we're just going to throw a bunch of parts together and make a jet. That's what the Learjet uh, Beechcraft Premier looks like. Um, I'm going to probably do a format video so I can kind of show you some of these planes. Uh, let's see, Beechcraft here. It's called the Beechcraft Premier One. You can look it up. There were 292 planes built, and it was Raytheon, Hawker, and Beechcraft that put this plane together. It was ugly. I mean, some people may think it's pretty, but it was produced in 1998. It was a cheap plane to put together, but literally, I... I remember when one showed up, it was the first time I had ever saw it. I looked at it. I was like, is it a Embraer 505 or whatever? You know, I thought it was a legacy plane. It was ugly. It, it, it just looks like, and it's really cheaply put together. <laughs> the pilot himself even said is like the plane breaks down more. So spends more time in the shop than anything, but it's a funky looking airplane. So look it up. Uh, 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 Beechcraft premiere. It's called. P as in Paul, Romeo, Echo, M as a Mary, Igloo, E-R. I'll put a link in the description box below to the Wikipedia page. Listen, I've said before, don't read Wikipedia. It, they, they, Yeah, it looks like a guppy fish. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Colin, you're right, Colin. It looks like a guppy fish. Um, I'll put a link in the description box for each of the airplanes that we're talking about here in the description box below. And... I'll make another video about all these planes, uh, some of the other jets that I missed out. But getting back to the conversation, corporate jets and corporate travel employs hundreds, if not thousands of people. You know, you've got mechanics, you've got the line guys like I used to work. You've got the parts uh, uh, people, um, which I'm doing now. I do parts now. Um, you've got the flight attendants, you got the pilots. Whenever you're watching the news and you hear somebody start to downplay, oh, these people are showing up in corporate jets. Oh, they're, they're elitists. They have to think of, they don't, they're, they're looking at getting ratings. That's all they think about. And to gap for your attention and to make you upset about it. Look away. You have to remember all the people that are employed with that one jet. Each private jet employs 
about 50 people just to keep them maintained, fueled, and flying. You're looking at about 50 people that touched that aircraft at one point, you know. So between 50 and 70 people employed by each jet that flies, depending on the size of the jet. And I get upset when I see people say, oh, well, that's a corporate jet, you know, business people. And, you know, they're they're the uber rich. Exactly. Yeah, they, they, they do fly those. But us av average Joes are the ones that keep the planes flying. And then without us, they're not going anywhere. Um, there's a gentleman named Julius. I'll put a link in his uh, for his. He uh, designed so you can build a citation, the first generation citation, with a citation of one, or I think it's a citation two. Um, you can build a citation RC plane. He builds one out of a uh, foam board, and I'll put a link for his uh, his video down below. Uh, I'm sure he'll. It's not. It's only a matter of time that he comes out with some more. Other planes that I didn't talk about were the twin engines, like the King Air, which is a really cool freaking airplane. Um, the first models that came out were the Queen Air. It was a six-cylinder flat. They were super underpowered. The military was a high buyer of those planes. Um, and then they they changed the Queen Air, became the C90, which was the baby King Air. It was a King Air. It was a it was a Queen Air changed with turboprops, and it became the baby King Air. The Queen Air wear went away, and then the baby King Air came in. Um, it carried a total of 10 passengers, same as the Queen Air. Um, it was just a little faster, and it also used Jet A fuel, which probably brought the price down a little bit. But maintenance-wise, of course, the maintenance cost went up if you were going to buy a King Air. Uh, there's different models of the King Air that are built. There are the big King Airs, which can sit up to like 25 to 30 people on board. And then you have the uh, smaller, of course, the, the C-90, which is the Baby King Air. Uh, also, the other aircraft that are uh, fall into the business style corporate aircraft travel would also be the Vision Jets with little V-tails that are built by Cirrus. Those are called SF-50s. You can look them up. They have uh, a pretty good website. They're all carbon fiber. It's got a big engine on the top. Now... That design first came out as a salamander. Germany was the first one. It was the Volkschlager. It was the people's jet. It was a fighter built out of wood with an engine on top of it. And they were the first one. It was a fighter plane used during World War II. That design came out during that period. They tried it with a V. They actually came out with two uh, horizontal tails like this, just like on the Lockheed Constellation. And which had a triple tail, sorry, but this one had two tails. And it was that design that later got employed into the Vision Jet. Um, you have the Vision Jet, you have the uh, uh, Citation uh, Fives, the, the little Citation Mustangs, which are the small ones that compete with the Vision Jet. It's a pretty little cool airplane. Honda Jet, yes, I, you said it correctly. Honda Jet, which is Honda came out with their own jet, and their plane is really unique. So it's it, if you're looking at the plane, it looks like something you would see in an anime cartoon. It, it looks like a funky little airplane. You, could, you can look it up, Colin. Honda Jet. Um, HJ400 is the call sign for the plane. Um, if you're ever following it on Flight, uh, uh, flight 24, um, they've started to pop up like crazy. It's an all-carbon fiber aircraft. Um, first of its kind to employ the jet engines away from the body instead of having the bot the plane the engines bind or slung underneath the wings but most private jets have the engines behind in the back of the, cock the cockpit and making it very loud the engines are actually on pylons sitting on the wing on the main wing and it's got a t-tail uh, makes it very quiet uh, it's probably one of the quietest, uh, small-style corporate jets out there. 
Um, it's got a fuel tank in the trunk. So what they call the trunk, it would be the tail, the very back tail of the plane. And you can put up to 800, 900 gallons into the plane. Um, it's a short haul plane. You could fly it. I'm sure that somebody's tried flying it a little farther, but you can't really do it. Oh, yeah. The Honda jet is really, it is, it is a really cool little jet. Um, working at the airport, I, I ran into a lot of them. Um, race car drivers fly them a lot. It's a glass cockpit inside. Those little airplanes will run you price wise. They're pretty expensive. They're over a million dollars, um, maybe 2 million, $3 million. But as a small business, if you're, you know, into real estate or anything like that, they do have those jets. There's a couple of places out there, a couple of uh, videos out there about the Honda jet. Really cool little airplane, and it, it, if you ever get a chance to see one, really cool little plane to watch fly. Um, I've got a couple of videos, a short videos of, of the plane landing and taking off in my video feed somewhere. Um, corporate travel has gotten out there more and more, and we've we've gone into the next age of corporate travel. Now it's Gulfstream came out with the biggest corporate jet that they have ever made. It's the Gulfstream 750. That is correct. This plane is huge. It looks like the size of an MD-80. Have you ever seen a, you know, back in my day, there was the MD-80 or the 727. It is about the size of the 727. It, it's got a huge long wingspan. This is called a Global Express. It's in that Global Express model. That plane can fly just as far as a 737 or a lot of the airlines. So Vision Jet, I'm sorry, uh, Vista Jet, which is one of the largest produce, uh, purchasers of that aircraft, uh, these these companies uh, are actually, they have these charter companies, they're called, and they have this plane. This plane is massive. It's basically a Gulfstream 4 exploded. It's basically huge. The inside of it has wood and silvers and leather seating and ambient uh, lighting inside. And some of them have, have a shower and a bed, uh, the ones that I've seen. And you're looking at like oh, close to 20 million per plane, maybe even more. I don't know. But uh, the Air Force has one. Um, our presidential uh, aviation fleet has one. Or two of them, they're used for senators, and they also do go to that Davos over there in Switzerland. But yeah, man, they're some of the greatest looking. I mean, corporate travel is is one of those things that it's it's going to be there. It's always going to be there. But again, when you see it, you got to think about the people that work on those planes. Just got to think about it. So um, there's also the Boeing Boeing business jets, which are like Donald Trump's plane, the 757, which is a really good pl big plane. Yeah, he's the only one. He's one of a couple of companies. Oh, there's one of a of, uh, few people that actually own the 757 as a business jet. The Saudis have a Boeing business jet. Was this a 747? Can you imagine? That's a freaking house on, on with four engines, and they fly around in it. Um, the BBBJ, which is also another Boeing business jet, the 737 is a Boeing business jet. It's basically a 737-400 with uh, winglets on the end, and it's built out inside uh, as a uh, corporate carrier. You have a, a range of different seating options inside, and, and you can carry about almost 50 to 60 people inside this plane. Um Canada Air has a bunch of business jets. They have ones that are as long as the CRJ 900. Uh, Ember Air now. Everybody has business jets, basically what I'm trying to say. Ember Air, Gulfstream, which is uh, uh, Bombardier, uh, uh, Bombardier, Challenger, uh, Citation, Lear, uh, who else? Uh, McDonnell Douglas. Uh, Airbus now has business jets. Uh, the Soviets have gotten into the Sukhoi has gotten into it now building business jets. So everybody's got a business jet. So, um, but when you ever get a chance, just type in business jets and you'll be able to find out all the videos you can. I'll try and put a link in the description box below 
wow, we made a long video today with eight, uh, almost, uh, what, 40 minutes. It's pretty cool. Um, little update on some of the things that I'm working on. Um, you're not going to really see it too well in the camera, but you, I'll tilt the camera up. You can see the tail for the storch. It's being worked on. I've got the wings on. Um, I got a little bit more stuff to go on. I got to get the servos in. Um, I've got to get the, uh, uh, touch up some more stuff. I got to put another windshield on it. Um, that one's being worked on. I also have, uh, 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 you can see the Liberty sport being built behind me. I got the servo pack in for the, uh, elevator and rudder. Um, next is to get the covering for it and also finish, uh, mounting the lower wing. Um, uh, little by little, I'm working on it. The lower wing, I got to get the servos in. Um, so I got to drill little holes to, to feed the wiring through. Also behind me, and you're not going to see it, but I guess I'll make a video of it separately, is the club cup, which is the yellow cup that I started building. I tore all the covering off and I started making videos. Uh, I just haven't been able to do so in a while. Uh, but uh, now with my change in career, uh, I'm still working in the aviation field. Uh, thanks for all the prayers and, you know, will wishes that, I, yeah, I, I changed jobs and it allows me to a little bit more flexibility to work on my planes and work on the hobbies that I like and spend more time at home and uh, with the ones that I love and, and enjoy uh, a little bit of nightlife with, uh, you know, like date nights with the wife. Um, and join them for the night flights. If you guys have seen some of the shorts that I put out for the night flights and enjoy my hobby a little bit more. It's not the only hobby that I do. I also do gardening. I don't want to make videos of gardening. I'm, it's not my at all. Thank you, Colin. Hey, just to let you know on your uh, video that you did of the T28, I shared it on uh, Facebook under the Gillows model Facebook page thing because I thought it was really cool. Um, maybe one day you make some videos on how you build those magnificent little airplanes. They're really cool. You do a really good job on them. Um, next week, we will talk about one of, a little bit of shop talk, and I'll talk a little bit more about the history. Um, I don't know which airplane we'll talk about, but we'll talk about one. Maybe we'll go into a little bit into... Oops, this one. Here we go. Twin Otters and the Havilland Corporation. And some of the planes they built that are pretty cool. The Havilland put out some really nice airplanes. Uh, Canadian company. Um, famous for putting out the Twin Otter, the Beaver, uh, the Caribou. A couple of pretty good airplanes. They had uh, two, two, two companies. Basically, the Havilland was one company in two different countries, Britain, Canada. So yeah, let's talk about the, the Havilland next week. How's that sound? So, uh, we will, uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks for joining up guys. And again, if you watch this on playback, hit the thumbs, like up thumbs. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'll try next time when I do make the video that the mic is on so you can hear me. I guess there's a knob on here that if you turn it down, it shuts the mic. It sh it shuts it off. I didn't know that, so uh, I'll remind, make sure to remember. But again, hit the thumbs like up button. Maybe share the video, and uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Colin EQRC, thank you very much for joining in tonight. Tell your friends again, 7:30 p.m., 4:30 Pacific time. We'll see you then. Model Man Frank out.